podcast is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Kingsbury College, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing to find out about one of your courses. Yes. Is that a daytime or an evening course? Evening. Right. I'll just get a few details from you, if I may. Fine. Could I have your full name first of all? It's Peter Wright. That's W R I G H T. Okay. And I don't need to know your exact age, but can you tell me which of these age groups you belong to? Eighteen to twenty-five, twenty-six to thirty-five. Thirty-six to forty-five, or over forty-five. Eighteen to twenty-five. Fine. And do you have a job, or are you a full-time student? I'm an accountant. I just do courses in my spare time for interest. Okay. Right. And your address, Mr. Wright? It's Eleven Forest Road. F O R E S T. Yes. Hmm. Is that in Kingsbury? Yes, it is. I'm just down the road here. And do you have a phone number? It's double nine two four seven one. That's my home number. I haven't got a work number. That's fine. We probably won't need it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Now you want to register for a course. Yes, cookery. Do you happen to know the exact title of the course? We've got Thai cookery on Wednesdays, or Mexican cookery on Fridays, or Mexican. I'd like to do both, but I'm busy on Wednesdays. Okay. Well, you can always do the other one next term, I suppose. Now, do you know when it begins? Is it the twenty-sixth of March? That's right, and it's forty-five pounds in total. That's including the ingredients. How would you like to pay? Card, cash? Can I send a check? You can, yes, as long as it arrives at least one week before the start of the course. Okay. And I'll just give you a reference number. If you could make a note of it and write it on the back. Yes. It's C Z nine four three. Yes, got that. Good. Well, there's just one last question. Do you have any special requirements that I should make a note of? Yes, there is one thing. I use a wheelchair. Right. So you need to have access for that. Okay. Don't worry. Your room is on the ground floor, and I'll make sure there are no steps involved. We can always put a ramp in. Thanks. So we look forward to seeing you on the twenty-sixth of March. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. The Airbus A380 is a revolution in aircraft technology. Today, I have as my guest Mr James Carr, who worked on the project. Mr Carr, when did you start working on the Airbus A380? I started working on the A380 project at the beginning of 2003, about a year after the first real construction began although work on the plane began in 2000. Can you tell us something about the plane? It is the biggest passenger jet in the world with a capacity of 550 to 600 seats. It is over 24 metres high and has a wingspan of around 80 metres. It has 20 wheels and weighs 421 tonnes without passengers and has a range of 14,800 kilometres. What exactly did your job involve? Were you working on the fuselage? No, I was working on the wing assembly at Broughton in North Wales. The fuselage and tail fins were made in Germany and Spain, and the final assembly took place in Toulouse, France. My job was to work on the computer-controlled wing panel assembly machines. These wing panels are not just sheets of metal, but have reinforcing stringers, which are long pieces of metal running along their length. The stringers are needed for strength. For the A380, Airbus invested heavily in automated machinery to fit these. The wing panel assembly machines cost around $12 million each, and there are now six of them. The machines required control programs to operate them, which told them where to go and what to do. I was responsible for the control programs. How many people were working on the wing assembly? It involved around 1,000 people, but this was a small percentage of the total, and they weren't all working at Broughton. Before the wing assembly took place, the wing had to be designed. This required massive amounts of research. The wing must be strong enough, but the weight must be kept to a minimum for safe takeoff and landing. The takeoff speeds for large aircraft can exceed 330 kilometres per hour. What was the factory at West Broughton like? Very big. The part I worked in was as high as a six- or seven-storey building. On some days, there were clouds inside the main building. There were other buildings, offices and departments inside the main buildings. Workers used bicycles, trucks and vans to get around inside. The building is the size of six-and-a-half football pitches. How did you test the wing? The wings went through several tests to confirm design and stress predictions. For the new aircraft, we tested one set of wings to destruction to find the strength. In other words, we completely destroyed the wing. We used another set of wings for fatigue testing. Fatigue testing is where we move the wings up and down repeatedly over a long period to check that they perform well and that no cracks appear. There were also test aircraft that pilots flew to check flying performance, fuel economy, loading and safety. How did you feel when the first plane was finished? The A380 is the most significant commercial aerospace project in over 30 years, and so it was good to be involved with something so important. On the 27th of April 2005, we watched as the A380 test aircraft flew for the first time, and there was a real sense of achievement. Did you have any problems during the construction? We didn't attempt a project of this size without expecting some problems. The whole thing was a problem-solving challenge from start to finish. Nothing was predictable. For example, while we were developing the programs, the robots nearly put holes in the wrong place and we had to start again. All these problems cost the company millions of dollars along the way. How much did the whole project cost? I would guess it cost around £8.4 billion or €12.6 billion. Euros. Thanks for talking to us, Mr Carl. Not at all.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Welcome to Eurostar International Customer Relations. For English, please press 1. Thanks. Your call will now be placed in a queue and answered as soon as an agent becomes available. Which journey would you like to make? London to Paris, return. And what is your date of travel, please? The 21st of March, coming back on the 6th of April. What time of day would you like to travel? Around midday is best for me. There is one departing at 12.09 from Waterloo Station. Pardon? Could you repeat that, please? 12.09. Nine minutes past 12. Yes. Nine minutes past twelve, gets to Paris at 15.59. Right. I need to check the times of the trains coming back as well on the 6th of April. The latest I can get back to Waterloo is 9.15pm. What's the last one I could catch to get back by 9.15? How about if you arrive at 21.53? Is that OK? I think that would be too late because the last bus is at 9.30. Could you give me the one before that, please? Yes, I'll give you that. 19.19 from Paris. Arrives London at 20.54. Sorry, what time was that from Paris? 19.19. Um, 19 minutes past seven. Sorry, I'm getting a bit mixed up. Could you run that by me again? Yes, of course. The train departs from Paris at 19.19 and it arrives in London at 20.54. Got that. That will be fine. I'll need two tickets. Can we get a discount with our ISIC student cards? Yes, of course. If you are under 26, you can get a discount making the price £59 for the round trip. I'm afraid I didn't quite catch that. Could you say it again? £59 for each return ticket, subject to availability. All right. Well, please, could you book those now? Yes. How would you like to pay? I'll pay with my visa card. Could you give me the name on the card and the number, please? The name is M. Kumada, K-U-M-A-D-A. The number is 49298935. 7321. Can I repeat that back to you? M. Kumada, 49298935-7321. That's correct. And what's the expiry date on the card? It's 0707. 0707. Thank you. That's fine. Would you like the tickets to be sent by post, or will you pick them up at the check-in at Waterloo? We'll pick them up at the check-in. Please remember to bring proof of your age with you when you travel. Just one more thing, please. I am from Japan and my friend is Chinese. Do we need visas to travel in Europe? I'm afraid I don't know. You'll need to contact the embassies of the countries you're going to. All of them? Oh, dear. Thank you for your call. Goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Scope Charity Office, how can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the Dragon Boat Race that you're asking people to take part in. Oh, yes. We still need a few more teams. Are you interested in joining the race? Yes. We want to enter a team but we don't know anything about it. Could I ask you for some more information first? Of course. I don't even know when it's being held. <laughs> it's taking place on the 2nd of July. Is that a Saturday? No, it's a Sunday. It's a much more popular day and more people can take part then. Right. And where's it being held? At the Brighton Marina. Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm an overseas student. Could you spell that for me? Yes. It's uh, Brighton Marina. That's M-A-R-I-N-A. -A. Mm -hmm. Do you know where it is? I'm not sure. It's a couple of miles past the Palace Pier. Oh, yes. I know it. You take a right turning off the coast road or you can cycle along the seafront. That's good. What time does the race start? Well... The first heats begin at 10am, but you need to register half an hour before that, at 9.30, and we really recommend that you aim to be there by 9. It's a good idea to arrange a meeting place for your team. Right. And the race is to help raise money for charity? It is. We're asking every team member to try and raise £35 by getting friends and or relatives to sponsor them. Every crew member will receive a free tournament T-shirt if your team manages to raise a £1,000 or more. Oh, that's quite good. Also, we're holding a raffle. Every crew member who takes part in the race this season will be entered into a free prize draw. Oh, what's the prize? It's pretty good. It's a holiday in Hong Kong. Sounds great. The man asks for more information. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Is there anything else you need to know? Uh, could you just tell me a little bit more about the teams? Well, you need to have a crew of 20 people for your dragon boat and you then need to agree on who's going to be the team captain. That will probably be you. Fine. Um, I've got a group of 20 people who are interested. Do all the team members have to be a certain age? Well, there's no age limit as such, but if you have a team member who's under 18, then they have to get their parents' permission to take part. Yes, that makes sense. It isn't dangerous, but we do have boats that turn over in the water, and for that reason we need to insist that everyone wears a life jacket as well. And you can hire life jackets from us when your team arrives. What do you advise people to wear? Well, most people wear a T-shirt, shorts and trainers. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you wear jeans or boots. In fact, 
it's a very good idea to bring some spare clothes. OK. It can get quite cold and wet if the weather's bad. And there's quite a bit of hanging around, especially if you qualify for the semi-finals or the final. I see what you mean. Have you got a name for your team? Oh, not yet, no. Well, you need to decide on one and then put it on the entrance form, which I'll send you. Oh, OK. So, if you'd like to give me your address, I'll be happy to send details first class. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about trumpets. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The trumpet is quite a remarkable instrument. Take the B-flat type, for instance, the kind of trumpet most people use today. If we stretched one out in a straight line, it would measure nearly 140 centimeters in length. What we see in the diagram, then, is a very long brass tube wrapped around itself in order to save space. To produce its characteristic sound, the musician blows continuously into the small metal cup on the left, called the mouthpiece, which is shaped to fit the lips. The air travels along the lead pipe and round the tuning slide, which can be moved in or out to change the instrument's pitch. The air then reaches the feature that distinguishes the trumpet from, for instance, a bugle, the three valves that extend from above the top to below the bottom of the instrument. Each valve can send the airflow one of two ways, either along the main pipe, the shortest route, or else into an extra length of tube, thus lowering the pitch of the sound being played. The musician does this by pressing one of the finger buttons at the top, diverting the air into the first tube if the first is pressed, into the second and shortest by using the second, or into the longest one, the third, by pressing number three. The air then continues its way round the bend in the lead pipe and along to the end at the widest part of the body, known as the bell, which projects the powerful sound forwards. Incidentally, all this breath forced through the metal of the instrument does of course contain water vapor, and this will start to condense and form droplets after a certain amount of playing. The result is a gurgling sound from the trumpet. So to avoid this, there is a device on the tuning slide called the water key, which when pressed lets the water drip out. The trumpet in one form or another has been around for a long time. The earliest type we have actual proof of was a short straight instrument used with marching soldiers by the ancient Egyptians' 18th dynasty, which makes it 3,500 years old, although other cultures in China and Peru certainly had something similar very early on. This use of the trumpet in military contexts, as well as at ceremonial occasions, was to continue through the times of the ancient Greeks and Romans, but it wasn't until the 17th century that it became a genuinely popular instrument, at least in the West. At the beginning of the 18th century, it was finally accepted as part of the typical orchestra, and the addition of valves in the 19th century, making it much more versatile, consolidated its position as a major orchestral instrument. Nowadays, the sound of the trumpet, which is of course both loud and clear, means that for many pieces it is used to lead the brass section of the orchestra.
this sound and its versatility have helped extend its use to other forms of music, such as jazz and pop. But there is another very practical reason for its widespread popularity. In comparison with many others, such as the tuba, the cello, or even the trombone, it is a fairly small instrument that can easily be transported and played just about anywhere. The downside of all this popularity, though, is that as everyone wants to be a trumpeter, it can be difficult for the young musician looking for work to find a vacancy. As a result, it's often the case that quite a few of the French horn players in a modern orchestra actually began their musical careers as trumpet players. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.